thanks to the organizers for this invitation. In fact, the original title of my presentation was, and still is, Therapy <coughs> of Intracranial Hypertension in Traumatic Brain Injury. But I deliberately chose to have this adaptation of an African saying that was very much loved by the former USA President Theodore Roosevelt. And the original saying was, speak softly, and then, just in case, you better carry something more convincing than your words. And that is, I think, an intelligent way to deal with intracranial pressure. Because I would like to spend the next 25 minutes with you going through the definition of raised intracranial pressure, <clears throat> then how to deal with ICP when ICP becomes a problem, and I would like to finish uh, focusing on the concept of having big weapons, big sticks. And my point will be that that will uh, give us more opportunities and more ethical concerns. So let's start with ICP. What I ICP is about? And what is the difference between a high ICP that can be controlled or can't? Because the definition of what a raised ICP is, of course, is very arbitrary. And uh, in this busy slide, I put some of the basic references concerning the threshold of ICP. Uh, in normal human adults, it should be less than 10 millimeters of mercury. But in clinical practice, a threshold around 20 millimeters of mercury. And you see, for a given duration, at least more than five minutes, it doesn't mean many things if you suction a patient and for 30 seconds ICP goes up. So for a threshold of a given duration, around 20 seemed to be a reasonable threshold. And in more recent publications, uh, we are still uh, playing somehow around this uh, magic 20 millimeter of mercury number. Um, that has been, of course, uh, uh, debated. But it comes uh, from, a, I think, a very strong database. That is the traumatic data bank from four USA centers at the end of the 80s. And this plot says a lot. You may see on this axis the percent of time is percent of monitoring time during which ICP stayed above a threshold. And in this case, the threshold was 20 millimeter of mercury. So those cases never had, never suffered raised intracranial pressure according to this definition. On the contrary, going in this direction, on, in those cases, ICP couldn't be controlled for any time during the monitoring uh, exercise. And you see on this axis, the probability of a very bad outcome being mortality or vegetative state. And it looks like there is a strong relationship between these two parameters. So the longer you stay with a high raised ICP, the worse the outcome is. These are quite old data. But very recently, is a couple of years ago, the Brain IT, which is a cooperation of centers in Europe, repeated this kind of exercise. And if you look at this colored plot, I think that the meaning is more or less the same. And you have here the millimeter of mercury, mercury and here you have the duration. And of course, red is bad. Proving that the longer you stay above a threshold, which is around 20 meters of mercury, the worse the outcome is. That was in 261 adults and has been repeated also for kids. Um, so the big issue is not if it's 20, 22, or 19. The big issue is, are we able to manage this ICP and to control it for going uh, down this uh, threshold. And these are the resources that are at our disposal when we deal with ICP. And in the ICU, we start with uh, si simply having the patient well oxygenated, well ventilated, and quiet, and going up using uh, CSF drainage, hyperosmolar therapy, induced hypocapnia, and up and up with more extreme measures. 
And the meaning of this uh, cartoon is that if you look on the right side of it, you see that there are harm effects, side effects that we don't like to have. So I think that the reasoning should be the more, uh, the more active we are and more aggressive we are, the more the patient pays the price for it, which is common in medicine. So the issue becomes how often ICP is a problem. Can we quantify how often the patient really do suffer raised ICP? And I have a word of caution. I will show you two publications on this issue, but there is nothing as arbitrary as ICP. Because ICP, by definition, is invasive. You decide to call the surgeon to open a hole in the skull and to put a probe into the brain. So you decide when ICP is measured or not. So all the data that I am going to show you are quite arbitrary because they don't describe what happens in the general population. They simply describe what happens in the patient that we have decided to submit to ICP measurement. So in this case, on approximately 200 cases that we collected in Milano for more than 20,000 hours of measurement, you see that 155 had a mean ICP greater than 20. And CPP was also a problem in a relevant percentage of them. And if you look at the therapy that we have used, that is the second arbitrary component. The first is the patient who, decide, who we decided to monitor. The second is how did we treat? That is a personal decision. But you see here that just one patient didn't need any treatment, while 67 or 76 require what we call a standard or a simply reinforced treatment, while 57 require the big sticks, the big aggressive treatments. But if you look carefully at the numbers, you see that barbiturates and decompression were used in a total of 21 cases, so 221. The first point I would like to make with you is that if you manage carefully, so you speak softly, only a really tiny proportion of patients do require extreme therapies. And the idea has been reinforced in three centers because that was, the first one was my own center and here I'm showing data that I collected with two friends of mine, Giuseppe Citerio and Luigi Beretta, who work in the Milano area. So we put together 407 patients and you see uh, approximately half of them got emergency surgery we act as a referral hospital. In general terms, one patient on five should require surgery. In our series, half of them do require surgery because they are transferred to our centers for being operated on. And then, if you go through the therapies that we have used, you see here that 80 patients require second tier treatments. Again, if you split the second tier, so the more extreme therapies, and you look at barbiturates or decompression, you see small numbers. In this series, 4% of our patients require decompression. That is a general point, very subjective, but I think very important. Because acting this way, these were the general outcome results that I feel are quite encouraging. Because if you look here, the overall favorable outcome, favorable meaning good recovery or moderate disability went approximately to 50, 53%. And that is a very simplistic plot, but you see that there is a quite uh, convincing relationship between the extent of the intracranial pressure rise, no problem, intermediate problem, tough problems, and the proportion between favorable and unfavorable. So ICP is a marker of severity. And raised ICP that we can't control is associated with worse outcome. If that is the case, how can we deal it with it? What are really the weapons that we may use and what we can do in order to prevent ICP rather than treating it when it's too late? And that is a second uh, uh, possibility that should be very well considered and it's well known to all of you that work in this field. That is very American. You see, I found it uh, two days ago in internet, and is a mug in which uh, a patient uh, wanted to have his own CT scan depicted. 
He was very proud of having survived, and you, you can't read, but he said, I survived this extradural hematoma, and I can be here with you drinking a coffee. I think it's a remarkable achievement. Not very good taste, but a, 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 remarkable, a remarkable achievement. So the first issue is, please, do prompt surgery. We are a ICU people. Without neurosurgeons, we are really defenseless. So don't forget, surgery is the main therapy against uh, raised intracranial hypertension. Then, what about prevent, preventing ICP? Because there are avoidable causes for ICP rise. Many often, we forget them. And if you go through this uh, slide, you see that an increased oxygen consumption, an increased venous presser, pressure in the chest, an increase undesirably arterial pressure, vasodilation in the cerebral vasculature, or an increase in cell volume, these are all parameters that we may somehow easily manage preventing the ICP rise. And if you concentrate on temperature, I am not talking about hypothermia. I am talking about, in this case, core temperature, and later on I will address uh, brain temperature, that makes a difference. These are Chinese data. And they present data recently in the Journal of Neurotrauma on more than 7,000 cases on, of TBI patients, and in this plot, more than 1,000 patients with severe TBI. And you see here mortality and temperature. It's very simple, perhaps it's simplistic, but it says a lot. It may also mean that when you have infection, you go worse, which is, uh, of course, quite sensible. But anyway, temperature matters. And we investigated the brain temperature. There are uh, ventricular probes which have a thermistor at the tip. So you put in the ventricle and you may have the temperature into the ventricle. And my colleague Sandra Rossi did this investigation and the point was that very often the brain is a little bit hotter than the core temperature. In this case, in these 20 cases, the average gap was 0.4 degrees. Uh, what is the meaning of this difference? The meaning is that in normal cases, you see here that, that the brain, sorry, the brain is hotter than the body core temperature, unless you have the compression. If the skull is partially removed, then the brain temperature becomes closer to the body temperature, or even a little bit colder, because the bone component of the skull acts as an insulator, explaining why the brain is hotter than uh, the, the rest of the body. And when the temperature goes up, ICP goes up as well, and vice versa here. So controlling uh, the temperature and preventing fever may help in preventing ICP. Back to the therapies we have. Uh, there is a selection, there is a range of options. What about uh, using the big sticks? So addressing the, the issue of the important weapons that we may use. Of course, uh, these include barbiturates, hypothermia, and the compression, and I don't have time to go through all of them. But I would like to make a few reflections with you regarding the compression, because the compression is, by definition, the ultimate ICP therapy, because ICP is the pressure that you have in a confined environment, which is the skull and the brain into the skull. If you open up the box, the confined environment is opened up, so you have more room, you have more space, and pressure goes down. And it could be very impressive. You see this is bifrontal decompression, definitely more room for the brain. And your society, the Australian, New Zealand, and some um, Saudi Arabian center published the DECRA trial. That I think was a, a fundamental trial. I'm not going to please you because I am going to criticize you as well, but that was fundamental first because it was extremely demanding. Because in order to enroll 155 patients, there was a, an impressive amount of work almost 4,000 patients screened for years and years because the definition for being enrolled was quite strict. It was diffuse brain damage. And then you published these 155, uh, 55, and what you did, 
in my view, is very much German-like. It's not like Italian way. Uh, because you were very strict, and you say the definition was, uh, what is the threshold for ICP? 20. So when you exceed ICP, when it's 21, which is perfectly right, but we would never apply in my country. We don't drive this way. We don't behave this way. So 21 for more than, let's say, a total of 15 minutes in one hour was enough to randomize the patient. So very strict, very diligent. And if you look at the data, you really did something like that because patients have been randomized between 21 and 23 minutes of mercury average. And you see that decompression was quite effective in reducing ICP, and barbiturates were good as well. But there was a benefit by using uh, decompression for controlling ICP, and the benefit uh, had to be translated in outcome. And that is the classical way of uh, categorizing, scoring outcome after uh, traumatic brain injury. Uh, favorable outcome, good recovery or moderate disability, or rather severe vegetative and death as unfavorable outcomes. So the more recent version of it, um, acknowledging that having five categories was a little bit brutal, it was a little bit insensitive, splitted the categories in upper and good recovery, moderate or severe disability, and the threshold for favorable remained here. So if you are independent, good recovery, moderate disability means that you may have problem, but you may function by yourself, you can go back somehow to the regular life that you were used to do before, then it's favorable, otherwise it's unfavorable. And your data proved a worsening of the proportion of patients with unfavorable outcome by using the compression. After statistical adjustment, there is no statistically uh, significant difference between the two categories, but the compression didn't work in order to improve outcome. Then, the new trial. This is Peter Atkinson, neurosurgeon, a friend of us, a neurosurgeon in Cambridge, and he ran a quite pragmatic uh, trial on the compression, not as strict as your trial, because the definition was quite wide. You see here, um, raised ICP, more than 25 for one 12 hours is quite a wide range, not in German-like, very pragmatic, but saying that when you can't control ICP with the normal means, then you proceed and randomize to medical treatment, including barbiturates or the compressive craniectomy. And what Peter got, that has been recently published last December in the New England, they got 400 patients, more or less, and they changed the splitting, the dichotomization between favorable and unfavorable. And the reasoning was, we are dealing with very severe patients. So we better accept that upper severe disability could be seen as favorable. And by dichotomizing this way, what they have produced is a new concept of severe disability that I think raises a lot of ethical concern. Severe disability means that you are dependent. You can't live by yourself. You can take care of yourself, but you can say that you can't um, be left alone at home 24 hours a day, or so you need continuous assistance, or you may need someone who helps you uh, after, let's say, seven, eight hours a day. That is the threshold separating upper to lower severe disability. So if you can be left home for, let's say, eight hours, but when you have to go uh, out of the home, you need assistance to take a taxi, to do errands for all these issues, then that is the difference between upper and lower severe disability. And these are the results of the Peter, uh, Peter Atkinson trial. And you see mortality was 50% in the control group, let's say the barbiturates group, while it was very much reduced by the compression. In the Australian trial, mortality was 19%. Here is 50%. So definitely more severe cases. But if we apply the new definition, there is and there was a difference, a statistically important and perhaps clinically relevant difference between doing or not performing a decompression. Here, the big, big ethical concern. 
because mortality has been reduced. In absolute terms, 22 patients, every 100 patients randomized, did survive thanks to the compression. What was the destiny of those patients? Look here. For having five, pa five patients with good recovery or moderate disability, we got six vegetative, uh, four in lower severe, and seven in upper severe disability. And if you look at the confidence interval, 95%, these are the actual numbers that we may expect in the next cases. Which raise concerns because it says that when you use the compression, you do create new problems because you make more survivors, but many of those survivors are totally depending. And this is my approach to this issue. Because if you look in general terms, TBI, and you think at what happens is that after the initial damage, you have a progressive damage, and raised ICP is simply a marker of this ongoing problem that leads, leads to brain loss. If this is the case, it uh, makes a difference if you have refractory ICP because of reversible problem, transient problems, or because you have a disaster that you are simply warned about by ICP. And if you look at this, this picture, you have clear the concept. ICP may impact the brain stem because of diffuse damage, let's say vascular vasodilation, or because of diffuse destruction of brain tissue. And if this is the case, what is the potential for recovery? Because you have to see in your patient the disaster that has already happened and what is left, what is still available for recovery. And I think that in this case, we have to deal with tissue integrity, uh, with connections, so synaptic activity and axonal integrity in the tissue uh, leading to brain function. And these are the Glasgow data based on uh, histopathological data, so based on autopsies. And there is no doubt the extent of uh, um, not functioning brain when patients survive severe head injury is directly linked to the extent of diffuse axonal injury. So tissue integrity, connection integrity, dictates, mandates how the patient go at the end. And we did some work in order to quantify by using the microdialysate, so extracellular concentration of tau protein, or by correlating MRI data with microdialysis in order to have hints, to have indicators of the extent of axonal disruption. And the issue, uh, at the best of my understanding, goes this way. On one hand, we have the brain loss, and on this hand, we have the potential. Can we better characterize our patients in order to make sense of it? Of course, there is a parameter that precedes injury, and which is age. And it is quite clear, these are data on more than 8,000 cases, that there is a proportion between getting older and the increasing proportion of patients who have a very bad outcome. I am sorry that the pointer doesn't work well, but you see here that vegetative state and unfavorable uh, after 40, sorry, John, for you and me, but there is really a linear relationship. The, the older you are, the, the less we are hopeful for recovery. And that is typical of the doctor. We have a young patient in very bad uh, shape, and we say, oh, he's so young. Should we make a decompression or not? So we are talking by emotions rather than talking by numbers and data. Because if we are wrong, what we are providing to the younger patients here is decades of surviving in vegetative state or persistent severe disability. So being young is not a good excuse to try to do something anyway, regardless of the figures. What about the prognostic factors? Can we be more precise in identifying the patient that are going to do well or not? Injury mechanism, brainstem integrity, the best neurological response which is our responsibility. Because very often in clinical trials, we don't know exactly how the patient were when they have been admitted to the ICU. So accurate narrow exam and prompt intervention, very early diagnosis and surgery, as I mentioned before. This is a case, but I am leading to arriving to conclusion, John. So you see here, we waited for three hours. And during these three hours, the shift 
increase, worsened, and then posterior artery infarction. So here, time was brain, and we lost time and brain. So if we have to do something, let's do it very soon, or decide that nothing can be done, either in surgery and in the ICU. And my final point, which is very crucial now in Europe, who is entitled to decide? The only one should be the patient, which is quite unlikely that could be played at the moment of taking these decisions, but it should be into the equation. So in conclusion, I think that we do have therapies. We do have ways to manage softly the beginning and then to use more extensive and uh, harmful interventions, but that goes in the direction of having uh, very important and severe responsibilities with the patients and the society. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nino, for a, a superb uh, delivery of a, a topic that um, really, having been involved in this for many, many years, has changed enormously. And I think uh, you made some comments about the emotion and the philosophy. But in many ways, I believe that is actually the key point here, because we can treat numbers, but at the end of the day, the survivors that we produce uh, are left with tremendous disabilities, which are lifelong. And that's a really important point. Um, we have a few minutes for some questions. Um, I, I may ask a question in the interim. You asked a question about uh, the patient's choice and a stepwise progression, and all the algorithms have an increasing level of therapeutic intensity as you go on. But no guideline tells you when to stop. When, when do we stop? When do we say it's too hard? When do we, when do we decide that uh, this patient's outcome is likely to be not in their interests? Um, the honest answer is that I don't know, but I know what I do, and I, I try to justify it myself. Uh, I think that we have an increasing body of data, an increasing body of evidence, uh, suggesting what kind of outcome is likely to be obtained. My view is that the Peter Atkinson trial uh, gives us data, but these data should be refined. Uh, I mentioned age, but I also may mention tissue integrity and external injury. If you have brainstem injury in an old patient, I think that it will be very easy to tell the family, to tell everybody, and to share with your colleagues that nothing could be done. On the contrary, if you have a patient who arrived moving quite well and has been deteriorating in the ER, and you do surgery very uh, soon, and the surgeon sees the brain uh, jumping off of the bone, then you may believe that there is still the potential for recovery. So it's very subjective at the moment, but we are going to have better data in order to support a decision that should be more rational than emotional. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think the, the information we receive from both DECRA and the rescue ICP trials have already changed the paradigm in terms of how we interpret these trials and outcomes. Any questions from the floor? Yes, Manoj Shaksaina. Hi, Nino. Fantastic talk over here. Hi. Uh, really, really nice talk. Um, my question is a practical one. Do you know, um, I think you've said quite nicely that the proportion of patients who have the very severe injury, a relatively small group, and trying to decide which big stick to use is difficult. Surgery, I think if I've understood correctly, is a good first option. I just wanted to ask how you choose between hypothermia and thiopentone. Um, what's your preference? The data you showed from your center was use of a bit of both, and also the other thing was hyperventilation. But I'm really interested in the thiopentone versus hypothermia question. Uh, thank you for the question. Again, very pragmatic, very subjective. Yeah. What we do is that we have a clear agreement with the surgeons. Mm. We don't like to open up the skull because the surgeon can't resist. And when they see the injured brain, brain they start removing it. And I am, I am used to say that nobody has enough brain and nobody definitely has too much brain. So we don't like to go surgery directly. So our choice is to have a couple of hours. Let's say that we have treated ICP the regular way, manitol, sedation, hyperventilation. I am using hyperventilation, but ICP is resistant. It's 25, 30, 25, 30, and it doesn't really uh, reach any stability. 
So the agreement is, for a couple of hours, we start thiopentone. The patient are already normothermic. If thiopentone works, well, otherwise we go to the OR. As for choosing between hypothermia and barbiturates, um, I don't have definitive data. Very often it depends on the guy who was on duty. And we use a very pragmatic approach. If fever was very relevant and normothermia worked somehow to reduce ICP, then we insist and we go down to 36, no lower than 35. Otherwise, we use barbiturates. But I can't teach on this issue. No, that's a very nice answer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We are out of time, unfortunately. There are a number of questions from the, the floor, uh, I think many of which will be addressed in the ses subsequent sessions when uh, Nina will be presenting further. So I want you to join me in thanking Professor Stacchetti for a superb presentation. <laughs> and we'll close the meeting, the session for the next meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you.